Hey YouTube, Emily Adams here, and today I'm going to be bringing you part one of my story. But before we get started, I wanted to share, I have linked my podcast, which is the Emily Adams Show, and also my Instagram, where I show up a lot on my Instagram stories in the description below. So if that's something that you are looking to connect more and to listen to my podcast, feel free to see those um, links in the description below. If you would be so kind to like this video and subscribe. I would appreciate it because that is how all YouTube channels grow. You know that as you watch YouTube. Um, but I'm just gonna dive in today to talk about part one of my story. Part one of my story is I grew up in the Amish culture and before I really get into it, there are multiple different Amishes and um, some of them have electricity. Others don't have electricity and others don't have running water. They're kind of in different categories depending on where you move or where you live. That's kind of the category that where you will follow their rules. I grew up with, we had gas stove, gas refrigerator, gas lights. We did have running water, but we didn't have any electricity, technology, or anything of that. So, um, and also in the Amish culture, everyone speaks German. So that's kind of the fluent language. And then outside of the home, they usually speak English or if you have a business or whatever, they speak English. So I grew up speaking German. And at the age of seven, I started going to school. I went to school and they only go to the eighth grade. And the eighth grade education is really like a sixth grade education equivalent to like the public schools. So went to school, the way we got to school, um, at one point we used to ride a bus and the bus would take us all to the Amish school. They have a, a private Amish school. And then other times I would rollerblade and my brother would ride the pony or we would drive the, the horse and buggy or whatever it was, that's how we got to school. And the school days looked similar to what public schools do, but um, the classroom rooms are very, so first through fourth grade are in one room and then four, fifth through eighth are in another room. So it's a two room um, schoolhouse. So that's kind of what school looked like. We had similar subjects like um, English, um, health. We didn't really have a health the way the, the public schools do. Um, and our language was like a high German versus what we spoke. And that was, um, we didn't learn, like I didn't learn um, algebra or trig or uh, geometry or any of that. Um, it's just kind of like the basics of math. So that's kind of the educational side of it. Um, I often get asked like, what did you do for fun growing up? What did we do for fun? We, pl I played outdoors a lot. I love to hang out with my brothers and to play with them. Um, it was very fun riding horses. Um, we used to make forts in the woods. Like I was very much tomboy, loved doing anything sports related. And um, that's kind of what we did for fun. I also loved to read. So I used to read a lot. We used to go to the public library. Um, also in the Amish culture, they have a lot of rules and regulations. So a lot of restrictions and a lot of rules. And especially around what you can wear, uh, what you can say, um, it is uh, based upon King James version of the Bible. So the Christian, like they identify as Christians. However, it is not a religion. It is a culture. So that's kind of the backstory of it. And growing up, I would say I was always curious. I was always curious on why did we have to live the way we live? Why were we living without electricity and making life so much harder when I knew that so clearly I knew that electricity existed because we went outside to buy our groceries and we had some friends that were not Amish, right? They were, um, they didn't belong to the culture, but we were still friends with them. So I kind of knew like the outside world and when we went on vacation and that kind of thing. And I always wondered like, why did we make this choice to live this way? And always curious and I would have these thoughts of what would it be like if I didn't have all these rules or these regulations and when I got out of school at the age of 13 and I had finished all my um, school kind of the career path for me was to like start learning cook clean so like do those things and then at 16 start dating 
and I'm probably married by 18 or 19 and then start having kids and be a stay at home mom. Cause that's kind of what the women do. The women are just stay at home moms. Um, none of the moms work at all. And it wasn't something that I would wanted to do at all. Like I was like, you know, that's, I don't want no part of it. I hated being indoors and I hated cooking, cleaning or sewing at all. Like I hated it and I didn't want to do any of it. Uh, so when I got out of school, I actually started helping my dad and we, I got really, really close with my dad and I went everywhere my dad went uh, to all the horse sales and helped him with all the horses and everything and with some of his business stuff. And I realized that the more that the older I got, the more I started to question. And of course, you know, I know the rules. They're very strict of like what you can and can't do and questioning the culture and questioning things wasn't something that you did. It wasn't like, hey, mom or dad, what if I just decided to leave the Amish? That was not something you did. That was not something you talked about. And it was a very uh, fear-based. So for me, like, there wasn't a way for me to express how I felt, or if I did express it, I knew it was gonna get shot down immediately because of the fact that you don't question the culture. You don't question the rules. You just abide by them and you just go. And if you know me for like, just from following me on social media, or if you've known me for any time, you know, that is not my style now. <laughs> I'm totally the opposite. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to go by those rules. Um, but when I got older, there was a lot of things that led up to wondering, you know, if this was really the life for me. And I started to question everything. And I really got to a point where there, the, the thing about that really got me was we say God is love in this culture. You know, God is love and he's such, you know, he was, he is the highest, like they look at him as the highest version, right? But when somebody makes a mistake or when something happens, there is so much judgment. There was so much hate, so much judgment and just, everything of like just attacking in this culture and it's just not in the Amish culture it happens in the world so I don't want to just say like it just happens in the Amish world because it happens everywhere right but growing up I would go to church and keep in mind church was three hours long and uh, you didn't get any breaks you sat through three hours of it so that was kind of what our church was like and it was it was every Sunday and I would go to church and hear this and I would wonder, if God is love, how come we still have all this hate? And we're being more taught about the rules and the regulations in the culture than we actually are about having a relationship with God. And that really bothered me. And we grew up, like I grew up, we read the Bible constantly and did all the Bible verses and did all these things. And so I get that and I understand that. But it, Coming from a teenager standpoint, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. And then um, at 16, I lost one of my friends in a buggy accident. And she, her and her boyfriend passed away. And at her funeral, there were some remarks made about not knowing if she would make it to heaven or not. And that really set me to really ask myself, can I really be a part of a culture that will sit here and not know and, and say these things at a funeral. Like it's no one's judgment for me. And at the moment, you know, it's no one's, no one can judge whether you're going to heaven or if there's a heaven or whatever there is, like whatever your belief is like, but to sit there and say that. And on the other hand say, you know, God is love. That was really hard for me to swallow and really hard for me to understand. And I kind of made a decision early on that, you know, this culture is not for me, but I had no idea how I was going to get out of it. I had no idea. And, um, I knew I, the last thing I, the last thing I wanted to do was talk to my parents about it because that was not an option. And I didn't talk to my parents at all about it, but I knew that somehow I was going to be able to get out of this culture because I wasn't going to stay. It didn't matter what it was going to take. I was not going to stay. Um, I was so frustrated with the things that were going on inside the culture and all the rules and the regulations and your socks had to be black, your dress was too short, your hair wasn't this and all these things, everything had a rule. 
everything. And it frustrated me to no end. It was like I was trapped in this cage, like I was a bird trapped in this cage, that my wings were broken. Like I wasn't gonna go anywhere. I wasn't gonna go anywhere. And it was, it was so like restrictive and I hated it. And it would just frustrate me and anger me. And you know, teenagers, we, they go through anger, right? And that's kind of where I was at. And then my parents told me that they were moving. And they weren't just moving to another settlement. They were actually starting a brand new settlement, which meant I had to leave all my friends behind. And I, and I had to leave my sisters behind that they were already married, but they weren't moving with us. And it was a two hour move. And this was a hard reality. And I remember the day that, the day that they told me they were moving. And I voiced my opinion. And I'm starting to get emotional. Um, I voiced my opinion of how is this fair to someone that just turned 16, just getting ready to date, to go and move to a complete new settlement where no one is starting. Like there was only like seven or 10 families gonna start. This was hard. It was really hard for me to accept. And I, at that moment, I became so angry and bitter towards my parents. Like, how could they do this? How could you make me move with you guys at the age of 16? Like, it just blew my mind. And I, of course, you know, I tried to voice that concern, but it was shot down. It didn't matter. I didn't have a choice. I was going, I had to leave. I didn't have a choice. And the more I knew about that, the angrier I became. And I, I was always looking for some way out. And I got in trouble because I had started uh, drinking. I um, drank a few weekends and got grounded and got warned that if I drank again, I was being gonna be grounded until they moved, which was like six months. Well, I got caught again, drinking. And um, mind you, in the Amish culture, it's like, if you do one thing wrong, your parents, if you do it on a Sunday night, because that's usually where their youth gathering is, if your pa your parents will hear it by Monday morning, it'll be on your parents' voicemail that, hey, she was out drinking and we saw her and all this stuff. And you're grounded. You don't have a choice. You can't justify your stuff. And I knew that my parents were going to find out. So what did I do? I did it again. I was part of that little side, little girl inside of me seeking attention, looking for something more, right? And I didn't even like the taste of alcohol. <laughs> um, but beside the point, but what I found was um, I got caught drinking again and got grounded until we moved. And um, this was a hard reality to face because now I couldn't hang out with my friends and I was moving. I was moving two hours away with no one that I was close to. And it wasn't like we could just jump on a Zoom call and connect with each other because we didn't have that. The phones were strictly used for businesses. So I didn't have a cell phone. And meanwhile, there was this guy. Um, I had known him for several years. And this is probably one of the hardest parts of my story to say is I didn't realize what was happening in the moment, right? The 16 year old in my and me was looking for some way out, some validation, right? There was this guy and uh, we started talking back and forth and just like I, he listened. He actually listened to what I had to say and he knew I was going through some things with my parents. And I, you know, shared like the frustration of having to move and all these things. And he was like, well, you know, you have an option. And I was like, yeah, I have an option to leave, but I don't know how. How do I, with zero money, zero anything, like just leave the Amish? And, I, and I'm 16. And if my parents find out about this, they're just going to come back and they're just going to make me stay. Like, I'm not going to have a choice. I don't have a choice. I have to move with them. And I knew I, if I left, my parents were just going to make me come back until I was 18 because they legally could. And we started talking back and forth. And of course, you know, he gave me the validation I needed. He gave me the attention I needed. And what I didn't realize was the type of person he was. 
because in that moment it was what I needed, right? I needed the validation. I needed like some kind of support system to help me get out of my current situation. Long story short, we move. I move to um, Kentucky with my parents and it's a two hour drive and um, it's a hard, it's a hard move. I cried almost every night because it just sucked. It was so hard to understand why. Why do I have to go through this? Knowing that I'm not going to fit in here, knowing that I was made for more, knowing that this wasn't the life I was gonna live, but yet I was stuck. And I was stuck in this in this place until I was 18. And I journaled a lot. I wrote so much. I journaled like every day just, just to write. And I kind of kept, I still kept in contact with this guy behind my parents' back. My parents did not know about it because clearly he was not Amish and he would not, they would not approve. <laughs> um, and I still kept in contact with him. And at, it was a couple months while we were living in Kentucky. I had, was, um, actually spent some time with my sisters and I came home and my mom had found all my journals. She had found them where I had hid them. I had hid all my journals because I didn't want my parents to know what I was writing and what I was feeling because I knew that I wasn't going to be heard. And in that moment, when my mom had told me, they had told me, they, both my parents were like, hey, Emily, we need to talk to you. And I come downstairs and I know like something is going down because I can tell it by their looks on their face that, yo, this is some pretty crazy stuff that I'm about to get hit with. I did not figure that she would find my diaries and they found it. And she read, they read them clearly. And my only question was, what did you do with them? Because I didn't want, I still wanted them because they were mine. And they had burnt all my diaries. Broke my heart. Because it was so hard to understand why they would do that. All, all of my feelings, everything was in these diaries. Like everything. It held my life. My deepest, darkest secrets. The things that I was planning to do in the future of leaving the Amish and not coming back. The way I did not like my parents. Quite honestly, in the moment, I hated my parents. And they had a conversation with me and wanted to know, like, they found out that I was talking to this guy. And he was 38 and I was 17. And I can still remember all the things my parents said to me. And mind you, like, I now have a good... <laughs> I won't tell you, like, the ending of the story, but... I now have a good relationship with my parents, so I don't want to like put all that in this video. But the things that were said were so hard for me to process and feel that I just blocked it in. I blocked it in and I told myself I wouldn't cry. So when my parents had a conversation with me, I blocked my feelings and my emotions. When they started yelling at me and started to tell me all these things, you know, you can't go to heaven if you leave the culture. You leave the culture, you're a disobedient in your family. You're not going to go to heaven. And was I scared? Hell yes, I was scared. I was like, oh shit, I don't know what's going to happen. But at the same time, I didn't allow that fear. I didn't show that fear. And I just was like, okay, whatever. Like, I just didn't say anything. And I got to the point where every time they would have a conversation about leaving the Amish and they told me, you know, if you leave before you're 18, we're just going to come get you. You're 17 right now. So you're, you're here for it right now. And I was like, okay, whatever. Like, I'm just going to be here. It is what it is. And I can remember just feeling so empty and hollow and not having a voice of just being trapped. Like I'm here for the next couple of months. I think I had like six more months before I turned 18. And I told myself in that moment when they were so determined to break me to get to stay that I was like, no, 
I will not be unbroken. I will not be broken to the point where I'm going to commit to stay. I'm not doing it. Like I was so set on this. And I got so tired of getting drilled about why do you want to leave? What is wrong with you? You of all the children, mind you, growing up, I was like the angel. Like I didn't step out of line much. And my, not to say that my brothers and sisters did because they didn't either. Like they weren't like horrible children. We weren't horrible children. But they kept asking me all these questions like, what happened? Why do you want to do this? Like and all and stuff that I couldn't answer. I'm like, I don't know. I just don't like it because you guys have all these regulations and all these stipulations and stuff, rules and stupid stuff. You think God is going to not let me go to heaven because I don't have black socks on? Like this used to be the conversations I would have. And we used to argue back and forth. And finally, I got to the point where I was like, you know what? I am done arguing. I am done with it all. And I told myself, I refuse to speak. I will say yes, no, and that's it. If they say come, have, start having a conversation again about trying to break me to get me to say, I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to shut up. And I'm going to see how many days in a row I can go without saying less than five words. That was where my mindset was at. Meanwhile, the people from the community came to visit me and told me what a disgrace I was. By leaving the Amish, I was ruining my life. I was killing my parents. My parents were healthy at the time. Still haven't killed my parents. I was such an, I was just full of evil. Interesting thought, right? And then I started getting letters. People would write me letters because rumors spread super, super fast in the Amish community. As soon as someone knows that you are getting ready to leave the Amish, rumors start flying. Oh, did you know she's doing this? Did you know she's doing that? And it's just like gossip central, which is crazy to me. But it's such a gossip central that everybody finds out about your issues and then they start gossiping. And then they want to come to you to listen to you. And I was like, no, I don't want to talk to you. I had so many people approach me that I didn't even have a relationship with and say, Emily, let's talk. Uh, and I was like, nope, not doing it, not talking. Like I'm done, like I'm not gonna talk to you because I knew what they wanted. They wanted to try to convince me to stay in the culture because that was the right thing to do. And I didn't want to, like, I was literally like, I was, I was just done. I just wanted to be gone and out of it. And it sucked to stay in it. And all these letters and all these, like, you're going to hell and like constant noise. This is the first time in my life where I got really, really good at blocking out stuff. And I blocked out everything. And I also blocked out the feelings and the emotions. And the only time I cried or showed emotion was when I was alone in my room because I knew that's, that was my only safe space. I couldn't write anymore because my parents were looking for my diary. And I literally was not going to allow them to find what my thoughts and feelings were anymore. And especially for them to just be trashed. That was like one of the most hurtful things that happened because it was a part of me. And um, so I would read a lot, spend a lot of time in my room as much as I could. And then a couple weeks of just like giving my parents the silent treatment and not talking to them. Um, my parents had asked me if I would go live with my sister. Um, and part of this was too, I had two younger brothers and I could potentially influence them to leave with me. And I think that was part of my parents' fears where she's gonna convince her younger brothers that Amish culture is not the way to live. So they had asked me if I would go live with my sister who was back home where I grew up at. I was like, yeah, like that's perfect. Like I'll go live with them because I knew I could also have even more contact with the guy that I was talking to. And I would have a better chance of leaving than I would in, in where I was currently living. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. 
So I lived with my sister for a couple of months and um, forever grateful for her to just provide that space for me to live with her. And I lived with her for a couple months and I still knew that I wasn't gonna stay Amish. And you know, me and her didn't really have the conversation of like, oh, you should stay Amish. Like she didn't try to convince me one way or the other. She was just there. She didn't like have a strong stance on it. Um, and then I realized that it didn't matter one way or the other, I was going to leave. And I made the decision that I was just going to leave before I was 18. Like I was just tired of it. I was tired of when my parents came to visit the awkwardness, the hatred, the judgment. I was just, I was over it. I was just done. And I made that choice to like, I'm going to leave. So I contacted um, the guy that I was talking to and I was like, hey, I'm going to leave. And he told me he would help me and um, made the decision to leave in the middle of the night. And I left in the middle of the night because of the fact that I didn't want to have to say goodbye to my sisters because I knew if I left the Amish, I'd be cut off from all my family because that was how it went. I'd be cut off from all of my friends, my family, everything. Once you make the decision, you're cut off, you're done. And you have the possibility of never having that relationship again. And I didn't wanna look at my sister and tell her goodbye. So I had told him that I was gonna leave in the middle of the night, pick the date and went up and wrote my sister a letter. And I wrote the letter, packed my things up and in the middle of the night, I, uh, there was a two story house and I was sleeping upstairs. In the middle of the night, um, there was like a porch outside the window. Opened the window, put my stuff outside on the porch roof, dropped it down and got out of the window and jumped off the porch and I left. And yes, it was a two story house. It was like the biggest jump of my life, <laughs> literally. And there was, there was times where, and it took, it was so hard for me to push myself out that window, even though I knew that's what I wanted, because there was so much fear. The, the fear of the unknown, the fear of what am I doing? What if I'm making a mistake? What if, like all these thoughts. But once I got outside the window and I was like, Oh, now I have to jump. And I was like, I have no idea. It was so hard for me to close my eyes and just jump. And I told myself, you have to do it. You don't have a choice. Like you've already dropped your stuff on the ground. You've already done it. Like close your eyes and jump. And I literally closed my eyes and jumped. And that's how I actually left. And it was, like I said, one of the biggest jumps of my life. And now I'm gonna stop this video in a little bit and just to kind of give you a teaser of what's coming up on part two is you're gonna find out what happened when I left and what I did not ever expect to happen and also what I learned from it. And let's just say that leaving a narcissist, someone that's an alcoholic, with two boys was probably right up there with jumping out that window of the hardest things I've had to do in my life. And I'm going to leave this video and I will see you on part two of my story.